So this is what I get for browsing on Instagram during the MJ BizCon. Um, a lot of people have been asking me about uh, this new system that I'm sure a ton of you have seen and people who are flooding in <laughs> when they do uh, are probably going to be aware of it. If not right now, they're going to be aware of it in the coming weeks. And that's about this uh, sort of DNA uh, molecular binding system for use as a um, uh, like a seed to sale sort of security um, system. So the idea is that you would spray this, uh, m you know, molecular substance or DNA or whatever, and then that um, uh, uh, that residue, I guess, binds with the plant or whatever you're trying to bind with. But in this case, they do it for cannabis, but apparent or they're trying to do it for cannabis, but they apparently do it for other things too, as sort of a way to give it a um, uh, sort of a, a signifier that can be checked later on and uh, down in the process for compliance sake or whatever. <clears throat> now, I decided that I would do a, a little bit of due diligence before I um, went on live to try to talk about it. Yeah, Cannabis Gardens is one of such people who uh, asked me about this system and uh, it piqued my interest so I thought I would take a little bit of time to go over um, what that even means. Uh, because uh, frankly, people are not people are not really aware of how it works, and they are perhaps understandably um, worried about what this could mean and, and what does it even mean? What do you mean you're spraying DNA? What kind of DNA? Um, no, it's a Jungle Boys video actually. Uh, Cha Science just re uh, reposted it, I believe. <clears throat> Several people have reposted that video. Apparently, it's getting a crazy amount of attention in a short time span. Um, uh, Spark Industries Washington says or asks, "What is the DNA carrier for a product like this?" Right. So this is the whole reason I have this video, and I'm probably going to answer that question a ton of times as people come online. Um, but here I'm talking about the. Um, so there's the Theracan, and I don't even know. I don't even know what company this is. I don't know who it is. Um, but I did find this company, which is um, Theracan, with two N's, like cannabis, launches the e the Etch Biotrace technology. So that's the kind of technology it is. That's the, the trademark name. And I mean, that's not the time, that's not the kind, but that's the brand name, rather. Um, I went to their webpage and I found this. Um, <clears throat> this little paragraph that sort of explains how it works, and I'm going to just break it down for you. I've already read it. <clears throat> says, Theracan is excited to fully introduce this breakthrough molecular tag and trace technology. Global regulatory bodies and cannabis brands have been limited by their reliance on traditional RFID and stickering systems said Jason Warnock, Chief Executive Officer of Theracan International Benchmark Corporation. The combination of Theracan's integration software and EPCIS standardized blockchain systems through multi-chain ventures, and in parentheses they put DBA, the TOEX platform, with applied DNA science's proven certain T, and that's a reserved mark, uh, platform creates a safe and secure way to manage the legal supply chain. That's the first paragraph. So already that gives us a little bit of information about um, like who the company is, this particular company anyways. Um, but the second paragraph is the one that gets into a little bit more sciencey detail. So it, go on, it goes on to say, the molecular tags used in the etch biotrace system is considered grass or generally recognized as safe. They are non-GMO, in fact, apparently, said Dr. James Hayward, president and CEO of Applied DNA Sciences. The typical daily diet includes about 100 parts DNA per million parts of food. Orally ingested DNA is hydrolyzed by the pH in the stomach. Our molecular tags are very small. Too small to function as genes. Typical tagging levels of use are in parts per billion, 
levels too small to have any impact on form or function, or the biological properties of cannabis, end quote. And then they go on to say, the Etch Biotrace patented technology provides true traceability, including the ability to track products from cultivation, extraction, and derivative processing into edibles or other forms that will provide a clear method to eliminate black and gray market products from entering the regulated marketplace worldwide. Okay, so I was curious if this was the case, and when I looked it up, it confirmed my suspicion. They aren't they aren't uh, spraying like full like genomes or anything like that, or, or totally um, completed chains of, of DNA. Uh, what they're what they're applying appears to be um, more like particles, more like parts of a DNA chain that can be that can be applied uh, through some sort of carrier. But as I was as pointed out here, I don't really know what that that is. They don't explain it uh, here, anyways. Um, they do explain that they use a ton less than you would normally consume of DNA, um, material. I mean, whatever, you know, I mean, I would be sort of curious to understand whether or not the DNA could somehow be, um, like absorbed by certain microbes and things like that. I don't know if there are any, um... Any sort of safeguards with regards to that, uh, but you know, I'd have to get more information about how what these even are, what these particles um, even really are, what they're based on, if they're wholly artificial, or if they're like based off of like a bacterium or uh, a fungus uh, or um, a virus or a fungus or anything like that, or even plant DNA itself, some sort of plastid. I don't really know. Um, no, no, they're grass. G A R A S which is generally recognized as safe, not grass as in Poaceae, the family of plants. No, the markers are not poisonous or anything like that. That's what that means, grass, right? And um, I'm going to also put this video up on YouTube as well. I might just stick it at the end of my, or the beginning rather, of my other video that I did today. Um, and uh, sort of put this article out in the description so other people can read about it. <clears throat> There's probably more information out there, but a cursory Google search didn't uh, turn up for me anything, but I didn't go into so much detail. Queen of the Night Owls says, I have many, many allergies, so how can they guarantee that I won't um, go into anaphylactic shock or have some other type of allergic reaction? I imagine that they um, guarantee it through um, making sure that the DNA that they use doesn't already trigger known allergies. But again, you can't control for all possible variability. And I am not uh, somebody who's a specialist in allergens or anything like that. So I don't really, I can't really speak to that so much. Cannabis says, if it's viral, then they could spray it in veg and it would stay through processing. There you go. So perhaps what it is is a, a viral particle or a, um, or something like Agrobacterium tumefaciens, where it can be sort of transgenic and it can, um, for lack of a better term, infect the uh, genetic material and like stay in there with the plant. Perhaps that's how they do it. That's a good point. I really doubt you're going in allergic shock. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. I don't think that it would happen. Um, I would imagine that this wouldn't paralyze and, and hurt you. Uh, you know, that is to say, <clears throat> I don't imagine that it would, um, once it's been burned, I don't think that it would affect you in the way that like an allergen might or that like a different kind of residue would. But I don't know what the filler, I'm filler, I don't know what the carrier is exactly or if it's all just pure that protein, I don't know. Uh, I really just don't know. Uh, there's too many questions with regards to that. Yeah, they, they were spraying fresh cut plants. So perhaps that's a very important aspect that the, the material has to be alive when um, when applying it. I'm getting a request for uh, J Paul 1989 to be in the live video, but 
I think that if I do that, unfortunately the video kind of wigs out and um, I won't always be able to save it, unfortunately. So I think that has to do with the kind of phone that I have. So unfortunately I'm not going to acquiesce to that, but if you wanted to say something in the comments I'd be happy to read it off and interact with that. Cannibalist says, I kind of don't like the reasoning for this process, but the science is super cool and interesting. I agree. It's sort of, um, I, I mean, like the idea of like seed to sale and making sure you don't have black market and gray market and all that. I understand the logic. Obviously, the BCC wants to do that and, you know, and um, like, yeah, I don't think this is going to be poisonous necessarily, but it, it does kind of suck that it's a thing, right? Like, it's surprising. It's it's well not surprising. It's a little bit ironic. Um, if this technology was used earlier, it might have really um, spelled out a very different cannabis legalization circumstance. But this is somewhat bleeding edge technology. It sounds like, or at least um, cutting edge technology. Maybe it has been used in other systems previous to cannabis, apparently. So um, it's not like it's an untested new technology. It's just being used in a new way. Um, yeah, I, I just don't, uh, I don't know. Let's see if there's any other information that I've left out or something. Looks like the company is um, Applied DNA Sciences and is publicly traded, I believe. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's this etch biotrace technology. So whatever, however they use that, however they do that is how they're doing it here. It's the same sort of technology. So it's not like they reinvented the wheel just for cannabis. Um, if I look that up. Perhaps I can find some more information on how it works, maybe? That would be nice. I came across a few videos on the Biotrace, uh, the, the Etch Bioscience, or Biotrace system, and uh, there were just a bunch of videos with a bunch of filler that didn't really talk about how they like operated, which I understand it's probably, te it's probably technical speak that a lot of people don't get, but for people like me who might be able to, um, deconstruct that, it's sort of unfortunate. Um, I don't really know. Can we talk about seed to sale and the obvious loophole for breeders selling seeds since we aren't tracking at pollination? Right. You know, like that, that's probably a, a big aspect of this. Um, let's try to risk a lot more control um, from that. You might not have to worry about that if you apply it, if, if you make it standard to apply this sort of an application um, regularly or in a way that kind of nullifies the pollination problem or the, the, the DNA uh, from crossing and that sort of a thing with breeding. Blaze Benjamins asks, what's the technology referring to? I just tuned in moments ago. Right. This is the Etch Biotrace technology from uh, Theracan with two N's, which is like, I think the company that everyone is, uh, going crazy on, uh, right now because of the marijuana bizcon, uh, people are seeing videos of, uh, the spray being applied to the plant and, you know, um, chaos ensues because they're worried about the potential health effects of that application. They're worried about all that sort of a thing. Queen of the Night Owls says, until they've proven that there's not going to be any allergy issues, I don't want to risk it. Well, they might not ever, like, do that, unfortunately. Or they might prove, at least in some other capacity, that's good enough. Because you can't prove a negative. You can't prove that nobody has an allergy to it. That's a little bit of an insane sort of uh, prerequisite for just about anything. You know, we sell foods that people do have allergic reactions to all the time that are very common. It doesn't make sense to um, ask of that. But what they can do instead is probably something almost as good, 
which is prove how it can't um, activate or um, or in some way elicit an allergic response. Perhaps there's something fundamental about it that um, that, that makes it in, in, incapable of that. I don't I don't really know. Uh, which is becoming my phrase for this video. Um, oh yeah, okay, so Cannabis got him for that, cool. Yeah. It's pat so patented or patent pending is probably why we can't get more info. Uh, no, this system has already been used quite a bit, but maybe, maybe there's something about that. Um, yeah. When I said spray... What do I mean? Like a pesticide? Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> no, it's like, I don't know. Maybe it's a carrier. Maybe it's purely this, like, micro DNA particle that they're talking about in this etched biotrace system. But that's what they were applying. So, well, it looked like an aerosol or, like, li almost liquid spray. And um, according to the article that I was reading, uh, they use it in parts per billion. So I imagine there's a carrier. And I don't know what it's composed of. It could just simply be water, for all I know. If it's not just water, though, I'd be curious to know what it is. Because that could very well, you know, change my opinion about whether or not this might um, affect somebody's uh, uh, allergic response. Or, or sort of an immune response, anyways. Um, yeah, I don't know. My <clears throat> My hot take on this is that without much more information, which is perhaps out there if I just were to search around a little bit more than I already did. Um, I don't know. I don't think that it's inherently dangerous is my hot take, particularly because it is used already. It's not bleeding edge technology. So I'm not like scared necessarily. Um, but I don't know enough about the product in general to really make an informed opinion or judgment about it, uh, particularly in cannabis, but also just in general. Now, for what it's being used for, I have an opinion on that, but for the technology itself, like, is it harmful? My hot take is that it's probably not harmful, particularly if you're going to um, smoke it or ingest it, which is what people do with it. So, I mean, like, with smoking, I don't imagine that it will, that, like, the the micro particles are going to uh, pyrolyze in a way that will like create uh, a toxic compound. I don't, I don't foresee that being a problem. And with regards to ingestion, um, if they really truly are just like based on a, on DNA that is already available that we eat or we consume all the time or interact with safely, then I also don't foresee that being a problem either. Uh, particularly if it's processed. I saw in a few captions that supposedly they can check extract too. Uh, so like, I don't really know. That's sort of interesting. I think that's, I think that's kind of, I mean, I'm impressed if that's the case, but maybe I shouldn't be. Maybe that's pretty, so maybe that's pretty unsurprising. I don't know. Um, yeah, they would need a neutral carrier. No, it says dabs candy. Yeah, I would, I would imagine. Cannabis says, it seems super unlikely that an entity which I could litigate against wouldn't have made serious effort to make sure it was safe, especially for a legal market with such high regulation. Yeah, I think that they've really dotted all their I's and crossed all their T's on this one, I would imagine. Blaze Benjamin says, it sounds like Eagle 20, kind of, probably in that it might be systemic. Uh, which, you know, if it's if it's DNA and there's a carrier or if the DNA like binds with the plant or if it's like virus DNA like we were supposing previously, um, if it is if it does have some sort of biological um, like binding effect, then they probably need the plant to be alive for that to happen for it to have some sort of transdermal um, like infection for lack of a better term. But it's totally speculative. Um, so yeah, I just uh, I find it interesting. I'm glad that people are interested in what they're in what they're doing here. Um, I would encourage people to not be uh, 
extremely and intensely reactionary and ebullient about it. Um, but that's just me. I try not to get super... I'm definitely not a stoic, but I, I definitely try to be very reserved when it comes to this sort of a thing. Um, and that's part of the reason why I made this video too, is to just caution against like extreme reaction, I guess, until you know more information about it, or you can get more information about it from somebody who can explain it better. I would be able to, I think, if I had the right info, but I just can't. Dinky808 says GMO. Apparently it's not. According to the article, they say that the DNA is non-genetically modified, which makes me wonder if it is indeed agrobacterium or another um, uh, organism or microbe that's, uh, well, it's not genetically modified, so maybe it's like natural, like Cas9 or something. Dabs Candy says, uh, sounds far-fetched for extracts. What if it's just a luminesque mar marker? Did you say that? Did you type that correctly? Did you mean luminesque? Oh, luminescent, I see. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think it's a chemical. I don't think it's a molecular chemical. Oh, I see that I'm just, I'm just catching up on the comments, apparently. Yeah. Um, yeah, and at least there's the option, you know, Queen of the Night Owls makes a good point. At least there's an option that people can get homegrown if they want, um, at least in some places, better than others. I definitely also encourage people to, like, grow for their own if they can. You know, it's true that, like, cannabis craft is very similar to, like, beer craft and wine craft and, um, uh, a lot of other, like, like, handcrafted sort of micro-oriented um, products, botanical products. However, um, unlike vintners who have um, grapes that they turn into wine or people who have barley or other kinds of oats or grains that they can turn into alcohol, um, you know, you need a ton of land to make a sizable amount of wine. And you need a ton of fruit to make beer and alcohol. But with regards to cannabis, you can kind of make a lot in a small space if you're, you know, if you're good enough or if you have everything sort of um, dialed in. So in that case, I think that it's a lot more encouraging for people who can grow by themselves to, to do so if they're worried about this sort of a thing. Um, it's a way more, it's way more possible for a cannabis grower to grow a, a much better proportion of, of a cannabis product per, um, uh, like, well, per like square foot than like a wine grower. <laughs> Somebody wants to drink wine, they're going to have to have a, a whole vine, vineyard, you know, unlike, for example, with cannabis. Yeah. And, and here I've had, I have a lovely bouquet of, of cannabis comments and yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I, um, I think that it's important that people, uh, I, I, I appreciate that people don't want to argue necessarily, but I also appreciate the sentiments that people have. I don't think that being concerned is bad. And I definitely don't think that it's uh, a bad idea to ask questions, ask a lot of questions and really make sure that what people are saying is the truth. Because certainly people have lied all the time, and you know, with the glyphosate case recently, uh, or with regards to, um, well, like tobacco, for example, right? There's tons of there's tons of examples where companies are like, "Oh, this is fine," and it's not, right? So I don't think that's I mean, being blind, you know, blindly following a company's point is not good. But I do think that there are some reasonable sorts of I guess factual appreciations that that people can take and and sort of like metacognate about like mm, maybe maybe this company is not going to worry about it because they could just get out of any legal case. Well, I don't think so. I think they've probably especially since they've already been doing this for a little while, 
um, they probably have a pretty good set of data and they can probably explain a lot of our questions or all of our questions. Um, but again, if you're not like a specialist or, or somebody who can like look at the technical data and information and, and develop a judgment, those are the people that we really rely on to do that sort of a thing. Um, but yeah, big technology increases create this sort of circumstance where uh, we can do this sort of a thing. And perhaps we can do this sort of a thing without hurting people. But, you know, more fundamentally, I think a lot of people are just not super into the seed to sale thing in general. So I think that levy, I think that's sort of misapplying, uh, I guess, your, your, your passion in that case. Because if you don't like the fact that there's any seed to sale technology at all, I mean, that's you know, that's a little bit separate from is this harmful to somebody's body? Because I think that's the, the main concern a lot of people have when they see this being sprayed on their product. Uh, and I think rightly so, right? But but maybe be a little bit reserved about it. Um, yeah, all the people who are... Um, it's glyphosate, not glyphosate. Unless I'm wrong? Hold on. I have a computer right here. How wrong am I? Glyphosate. Yeah, it's glyphosate, not glyphosate. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So anyways, that's for those people who are joining, who don't know what's going on and why people are arguing in the comments. Um, basically, I looked up the um, Etch Biotrace system uh, and Theracan is a parent company. And apparently they've been using the Etch Bio, uh, Biotrace for cannabis. I think that's what people are seeing in these videos. And, um, I just wanted to kind of talk about how they do that. It seems that they use some sort of micro protein or micro DNA particle that they apply in uh, parts per billion, they said, and supposedly it allows the product to be, um, essentially marked in such a way that they could test for it. Um, some people are saying through extraction, but I don't think so. I think just just through up until like processing. At least that's what they said on the website that I looked up. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's Theracan with two N's. That's the company that's specifically going, uh, using this technology specifically in cannabis. But the technology is called the Etch Biotrace system. I'm looking at it right here. So yeah, that's that's what we're doing. That's what we're talking about here. <laughs> could it be an amino acid? Uh, yeah, it could be an amino acid. I don't, you know, um, I think it's something that binds that they said it's non GMO. Um, and if, you know, so like they probably are, um, taking advantage of a natural process kind of like Cas9 does or CRISPR does. Um, or like the use of agrobacterium to insert DNA, foreign DNA, any kind of DNA, really. They put it into the bacterium. And the bacterium has a natural process by, by the way that it infects a plant or a host um, that inserts DNA and makes the cell replicate it. Well, if you put a different kind of DNA in there and have that process, ins have that DNA inserted into the plant, you can essentially, that's how you get transgenic plants a lot of the time. They just use the same mechanism and they just put the DNA in the mechanism, the cellular mechanism, and then it just, like a machine, like a biological machine, just rapidly uh, infects the cells and makes the cells create this, um, whatever they're doing with the DNA, whatever that causes uh, that to happen in the plant host. So that's perhaps how they're doing it. I don't know. So they basically just run chromatography and are able to see these markers. Uh, I don't know. I guess so. Uh, no, because it's supposed to be it's supposed to be DNA. 
Um, so maybe they test for, I guess maybe they do that. I just, uh, I don't really know that answer. I should, I should look it up probably. But um, they're being a little bit cagey with the information, unless somebody has found it already. In which case, I'd be happy to hear it from somebody who has. Um, but I don't, I don't see that. Um, they do mention something about like a about like blockchain um, tracing and tagging. Let's see. Let's see if this tells me anything. It looks like, yeah, I keep getting this same sort of press release is what it is. Hmm. But that's a press release from Theracan, not Etch Biotrace. And they definitely don't go into detail on their website at all. It's incredibly devoid of any sort of information that would be relevant to this conversation. No, no, there's literally no information. All right. Yeah, I guess not. I guess they're just going to be cagey about it and just not tell us, uh, which is not, not terribly endearing, I have to say. Not terribly endearing indeed. Um, so the bacteria DNA would infect the plant DNA and replicate. Actually, it would. So uh, um, Agrobacterium tumefaciens has it inserts DNA that tells the plant tells the plant cell to produce certain um, uh, enzymes or, and amino acids and things like that that it consumes for food. That's the uh, original intent intent. That's the original thing that the process does. But if you take out that DNA and plop in new DNA and you put the bacteria, you, you infect the plant with the bacterium, then it will just insert the same, str what it thinks, what it thinks, what it is uh, uh, using as a strand of DNA, whatever that would normally be to produce those amino acids, it would instead produce the DNA that somebody put in the in the organism, and that can have a range of effects. But that's how that's a lot of that's one of the most common ways to create transgenic plants is to do that. So it's like program file uh, phylos release for genetic marking for cannabis. Yeah, I guess kind of, kind of. I, I like where you're going there with the phylos and the the DNA uh, marking and the understanding of that. I think this is actually just a, it's more like a DNA barcode that's made to be a barcode rather than a, um, uh, rather than like, what'd you say? Oh yeah. Rather than like telling us whether it's like OG Kush or not, or something like that, I suppose. But I guess you could do both of those things. So you just have to have that information in the barcode, essentially the micro DNA particles. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Etch Biotrace system, which it seems to be what uh, a company called Theracan is using to apply this sort of marker, this DNA barcode, to cannabis plants. So that's that. That's what that is. And um, a lot of people are freaking out about it worrying about it being poisonous, potentially worrying about it being uh, problematic for some reason. For a lot of people, this is the first time they've heard of it, uh, but apparently I did a little bit of digging and it turns out that it's not the first time they've used the, the process, the etch biotrace system, but it is the first time they've been using it in cannabis for obvious reasons. And that's what's getting it a lot of social media attention about like a few hours ago. I, I want to say is when it when it kind of broke, or maybe a little bit longer than that. At least that's when I started noticing it. Appreciate the compliment, Alan Blaze. Um, is that to be more 
strain specific, I assume you mean? What's the intended use? Oh, it's for, yeah, it's for seed to sale. It's for understanding. It's basically, you spray it on a batch, a batch. You spray it on a, a, a site, a cultivation site. And, um, for track and trace. And since cult, I think cultivars are part of track and trace, right? So yeah, you might want to put that information. This is, I don't know, OG Kush, uh, you know, harvested X time, um, or around X time or whatever. And, you know, sold at, you know, not, not sold, but you, you can put all this information into this, into these, uh, DNA particles and then you spray it on the plant. So because it's biological, there must be some way they can read it that way. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting technology to be honest. And apparently they use it in, um, in other produce for, I guess, similar sorts of things, maybe to make sure that there's a quality control going on. Like maybe you can't put like stickers on the plants or the produce necessarily for whatever reason. Um, but you want to make sure that you can track and know where like a specific, like maybe, maybe if somebody got sick from a pesticide, uh, they could take a batch of like cherries or something and they can track, oh, okay, this batch of cherries came from this grower. And then they investigate them and find out they're using, you know, tons of pesticides that they shouldn't be. And they get closed down or, or something like that. So I think that's what, one way you could use that um, that technology in a non-cannabis scenario. And a cannabis scenario, I suppose. You could absolutely 100% know whether or not um, uh, this particular product was grown in a particular place based off of this, um, this micro-DNA particle that they apply. And now to look at the comments. Uh, Dabs Candy says, I've heard it could also be a genetic bark. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, to keep from um, companies uh, selling it out in uh, black market sales. I could, yeah. I mean, that's seed to sale. Yeah, that's part of the compliance testing. Yeah, you don't want, I mean, that's part of the deal, right? To make sure that people aren't selling it illegally, that would include the cultivators. So. It's very interesting, but it could definitely be traced back to you if your stuff is in the black market. Exactly, right? So that's the main reason they said it's being used for. If that's the case, I'd rather just have them put a, a tamper-proof label. Well, it's not... If that was me speculating, but that's the kind of thing you could use it for, um, as I understand the technology to work. Uh, you essentially know where the produce is going. So for all of the situations where you would want to know where the produce is from, for example, a poisoning, then you can use this, uh, this etch biotrace system. These microparticles are sprayed on the produce so you know, okay, these Granny Smith apples came from Beloved Farms, you know, orchard up in wherever, and, you know, you can find that out really quickly. You can just, you can just take the produce, get it analyzed, come back you know where it's from. Uh, if it wasn't for how like 1984, it kind of feels to say, uh, I could see like vigilante people, vigilante people. I could see like nerds, um, taking this information or at least getting a way to read the information themselves and then know where their produce is coming from. And then you could use that information anytime you got sick. Honestly, if the technology democratized, it could be very useful it could be kind of a consumer rights thing because ultimately you want to know where your produce is coming from. And if you suspect that your organic produce has a bunch of pesticides you don't want, or you suspect that your non-organic produce has pesticides that you don't want easy, you know, you just get someone who has the technology if it's democratized and people can like get it. And then you can just put that cherry or you put that pear in there and you find out, you know, what's in there and what's going on. Um, yeah, so. Wouldn't it just be easier to map and register genetics to each company? But you can, f you can fool that. Um, yeah, if everyone was ethical and nobody ever lied, then that would be fine. Uh, except that people do that, 
and this would be one way that you would get uh you would get rid of that variable of um human human malice and and human uh disregard for the law if you were cuz you know people who are spraying pesticides are probably going to be unscrupulous about a bunch of other things people spraying them illegally or in a way that they shouldn't be anyways um if they're using a pesticide that's illegal they're not they're going to take matters to like take the like expunge the records and 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 make it so that people don't know what's going on they're not going to keep a ledger of their um necessarily anyways they're not going to keep a ledger of their uh pesticides they're not supposed to be using right so you're right it might be a little bit easier but it also um you know and the same thing for this no no sort of technology and no sort of um procedures foolproof and you could definitely run into a problem where maybe somebody sprays a different particle onto this particle you can have it that you maybe you can apply a compound or you can apply um too many barcodes and muddle the system maybe like um you know so nothing's perfect i'm not saying this is perfect or or even necessary necessarily but um it is technology it is ag tech and it's interesting and it's got a lot of people talking so i wanted to talk about it too yeah, someone's going to make a wash that'll scramble it, right? That's possible. Somebody could very well do that. Talking about the DNA applications to plants to track them. Yep, that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah, um it's the etch bio trace system and it's by Thermacan with two ends. And I think that's the company that's getting all this media craze um from MJ Bizcon. However, I don't actually know that. Um I only know what I just Googled for like 10 minutes. Cursory Google search. Um, let's develop a seed soak process for BioTrace. Uh, I guess you might be able to do something like that. Like you could maybe use an endophyte that like resided in the plant maybe. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there, there are some interesting applications for this sort of technology, I have to admit. Uh, but I just don't know very much about it, so it's really hard for me to render any sort of, like, a judgment on it. Ooh. Sorry about that. Yeah. However, I, um, I don't, what I don't want is I don't want people to become sort of, like, needlessly afraid or worried for their health. I think people should always be concerned about new products coming on the market, and they shouldn't necessarily trust what people say at face value. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to kind of go on live and talk about it while people were talking about this so much. <laughs> this is my Google search. Well, you're welcome. Because <laughs> um, they're not really saying very much, unfortunately. I wish I could tell you more, but the... Um, I'm on it right now. The Etch Biotrace uh, website is incredibly simple and not forthcoming with information. So it doesn't really endear me with confidence. Um, but they're probably aware, they're probably afraid of like maybe the technically illiterate taking a look at some of their wording and going. This is a disaster. This is probably what they're doing. They probably don't want the information out there because they don't want to be misinterpreted or something like that. Or maybe it's patent pending, somebody was saying. I don't really know. Yeah, Alan Blaze, you're totally welcome. Um, yeah, come, you know, come in, go out whenever you need to. Um, I'm glad that you found this entertaining and helpful. Um, yeah, guys, so we're talking about uh, the Biotrace, the Etch Biotrace system by Thermacan, the um, the uh, really popular video that's going around social media of the, um, the cannabis plant being sprayed with some sort of substance that, like, is DNA. A lot of people are surprised and not really sure what that even means, so I've been talking about the technology, which is this etch biotrace technology. It's being used by a cannabis company, particularly for cannabis, but it's been used uh, in other agricultural applications, apparently. So that's what that is. Um, 
Yeah, I love the info. Stay doing what you're doing. Stay vigilant. Yeah, I appreciate it. Definitely. I'll drink to that. <laughs> Haven't heard of the video until now. Well, here's you heard it here first then. Um, company that I don't know uh, gets Instagram famous for this video of this plant being sprayed by this like liquid gas sort of looking thing. And um, apparently it's DNA that's being used as a barcode. It is a Jungle Boys post, that's correct. So that's the initial post that, at least as far as I know, has the most, like, comments and, and, and activity on it. But a bunch of people have also reposted it, too. Today I am drinking Tia Guan Yin, which I developed a taste for when I lived in China. It's pretty popular there. Um... Tia Guan Yin stands for uh, Guan Yin, which is the Iron Goddess of Mercy, and it's her tea, I guess. So it's very it's roasted. It's an oolong for those who know what that means. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's a uh, it's a nice flavor, and I like it. And I forgot that I had it steeping this entire time, so it's a little strong. Yeah, you can check it out at Cha Science or Jungle Boys. Green Gold Farms, I think, posted about it, which is kind of local to where I live in San Diego. Um, no, they're not. Yeah, uh, Danky08 asks if Jungle Boys is a part of this project. No, not to my knowledge anyways. They just posted about it, and because they have a ton of followers, pe people people found out, and people started talking. <laughs> a lot. Um so that's kind of what that is. Bedrock Dabbers is online. So we're talking about this video uh, that Jungle Boys posted for like the umpteenth time I'm going to say this. I wish I could have like something scrolling that just showed <laughs> what I was talking about. Um, uh, but it's this, uh, this sort of new technology. It's been used before in agriculture called the Etch Biotrace System. And I think that's what this uh, company, Therna, Therma Can, um, is uh, is using is is well advertising in the cannabis space for seed to sale technology. It's DNA barcoding that you can apply on the plant so that further down the line you can confirm or deny if a batch is what it says it is, which is kind of neat. Uh, but people are concerned uh, for their health; they don't know very much about it. Apparently Etch Biotrace is uh, non-GMO according to their website and it's also um, uh, generally recognized as safe which is probably what you want for an agricultural crop <laughs> product. Oh I can pin a comment to the bottom I forgot that I could even do that so I should probably do that. So is this DNA marking used exactly like this on any type of produce anywhere else? It is. Yeah. It has been used in agriculture before. Yes, it has, actually. Um, yeah, it sounds like some Monsanto business, he says. Yeah, I thought somebody might say something like that. Um, not that I am a, a supporter or anything like that. Yeah, no, it has. Cannabis it has been used in other agricultural products. So it's not like Bleeding Edge. It's just a new company uh, using a sim using the same technology for cannabis specifically. Um, and uh, like I was saying previously, I can see how somebody would use this in a different setting. Like if you had an orchard of apples, what you could do is you could spray this on a batch of apples. And let's say somebody gets sick and they get poisoned by some pesticide that's not supposed to be used... Uh, well, what you can do is you can take the produce out of the bag, if they still have some of it, for example, like if they bought cherries or, or apples in this example, and you could just take part of the produce and you can go and get it tested or analyzed in some way and you can tell exactly, you know, these Granny Smith apples or these cherries came from, you know, you know, Oak Deer Farms or, 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 or Connecticut, you know, Happy Grow Orchard or whatever. And then they can investigate and find out if they were using illegal pesticides or something like that. 
Uh, that's just one application that's speculative, but it's the kind of reasoning behind this sort of um, this sort of a product, anyways. Thank you. Wait asks how how were the results of when it was used before? How did the public take it? Uh, I don't know. I just found out just now. I actually wasn't aware of this technology until very recently. Um, I know that experimentation on similar sorts of things has been going on for a while, and we've we've had transgenic uh, plants and things like that for a while, and we've used, um, like I was saying before, agrobacterium to uh, insert foreign DNA into plants. We've done that for a long time. Um, so it's sort of more the same in that way. But a lot of people haven't seen this in cannabis for obvious reasons. It's very new in particular. So people who haven't seen it before are kind of uh, concerned and, and, and very reactionary to what's going on, which is understandable. But I thought I would talk about it. Uh, cannabis proposes, Etch Trace is non-GMO, but if it permanently altered the cannabis genetically, doesn't that make the cannabis GMO? Uh, no, not by the definition of genetically modified organism uh, for the, I think, FDA, uh, who who makes that call. Um, it wouldn't make it GMO. It would have to be, um, it would have to, if it actually did modify the cannabis plant, um, the, the cannabis plant's genome, then perhaps so. But I imagine that this is not going to be considered like a genotypic change. I assume that what it does is it binds with the plant and doesn't actually cause any mutation or change um, with the expression of genes. But I don't know. And the website doesn't tell you anything at all. So I can't really go any further than that but to speculate with the uh, context that I already have from sort of similar kinds of technologies. But it is interesting, and it does have people talking. So there's that. I think... Oh, Cannibalist says, I'm going with viral. All on black. I think it might be. It could be a bacterium. I might uh, I might not be surprised either way. Some sort of microbe. Uh, they said it's non-GMO, so I have to I have to figure that it must be that they're using some sort of microbes like machinery, for lack of a better term, to utilize it in this regard, um, like Cas9 or CRISPR does. So I don't know, but I imagine it might be something like that. We're probably using something similar. Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to talk about. I don't want this to drag on too long. Uh, but everyone who participated, I appreciated the uh, the discussion. I thought that people had a really had really cool and somewhat predictable um, sentiments regarding the technology. Uh, and I think that it is important for people to, once they find out about this technology, ask a ton of questions, ask all the questions, uh, and, uh, <laughs> find out more. Cause I am certainly not being, I'm not able to find out more. Their website is uh, very, very not forthcoming, which is a little bit frustrating. Uh, but my hot take is that I'm not really super concerned, at least for, at least in a health, um, capacity but I uh, don't know enough about it to really know. So I am I am somewhat concerned as well. Yeah, um, this video is going to go on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol. Everyone who is not subscribed should subscribe if they want to have access to these sorts of videos in the future for my Xenthanol Live playlist, which I'm at like 15 or 16 or something at this point. So yeah, so... If you liked the discussion or if you remembered a particular thing that we talked about, but you know the live feed is going to be gone in 24 hours, you can always go to my YouTube channel and check them out. That's also where I make a bunch of free content uh, with regards to pests and pathogens and other sorts of ag tech and things in the industry. So have a good one, and I hope that all of you can find out more about this interesting technology. In this video, I'm going to talk about the USDA and their investments in critical plant pest problems. 
a total of $4.7 million has been invested by the USDA to attack pest issues. And I'm a big fan of supporting situations where in which government agencies or private institutions or really anyone supports ecological and environmental health. Um, and anyone who wants to talk about such things can go into the comments here and um, comment on it and ask questions and that sort of a thing. This video is going to be on YouTube where I've also talked about things like this and on my social media, of course. The paragraph in this article, which is written by Christina Herrick, says the USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture recently awarded 16 applied research and development grants to enhance the development, adoption, and implementation of innovative, ecologically-based, sustainable, integrated pest management technologies, tools, and strategies that address regional and or national IPM priorities. Pretty big thing, pretty cool thing. I mean, $4.7 million is not a ton of money when it comes to the entirety of government spending in the United States at least, um, but it's still better than nothing, and still multiple millions of dollars, so I'm not going to lambast them for not spending more or anything like that. I don't work in the USDA, I don't know how hard or how easy that is for upper echelons and lower echelons to figure that whole thing out, but I did want to go over it, and I wanted to um, touch on what this article touches on, which is that there are several specific projects, apparently. Um, the second paragraph goes on and says that among the projects funded include the use of photobiology and lighting technologies for suppression of powdery mildew in strawberry production, which I've seen several research reports about, which is very mm -hmm. interesting, and I very much support the endeavor. These grants are a part of the NIFA's Crop Protection and Pest Management Program, which addresses an integrated pest integrated pest management solutions for emerging weed disease and insect pests. And they have a few bullet points here, one of which is the use of thermotherapy for non-chemical management of cryptic infections of strawberry transplants and emerging fungicide-resistant populations in the University of Florida. University of Florida, if you didn't know, is an incredibly great um, uh, entomology and nematology department, or they have a very great entomology department in general. Um, I've worked with people who work there before. I've done, um, I was a part of a project that was looking for Q biotype, which is an insecticidal resistant biotype of uh, Bamesia tabasi, the silver leaf white fly. And here in California, at the particular places I was sampling, 100% Q biotype. So that was important. Um, I have a another bullet point here, the multi-state approach to quantifying and managing insecticide resistance in Plutella xylostella, which is the diamondback moth, in mm -hmm. coal crops, University of Georgia. Uh, the diamondback moth is a very, very, very um, common moth, and I see it all the time in Gerber production, in rose production, uh, less so in rose pretty much never in rose production. I'm just commonly associating the two flower crops, but I also see them in cannabis and I also see them in a ton of other crops and coal crops are a very good example, probably the biggest example. Um, and they're, they're a huge problem. And a lot of the, uh, sp a lot of the populations are becoming resistant. So it's really important for people to find new non-chemical ways to control the populations. And a lot of the non-chemical ways are kind of unique and rely on some very interesting technology. So I'm looking forward to seeing that happen. Um, they also say that they're developing a multi-life stage management strategy for apple maggot through the integration of attract and kill biological control in the University of Massachusetts. Very nice. Development and demonstration of short and long-term strategies for management of the resurgent blueberry stem gall wasp in the Michigan State University and leveraging pest behavior for implementation of biocontrol for plum uh, curculio from Rutgers University. Um, and there's two more. I'll, I'll just go over them now. Applied research and rapid extension of discoveries in photobiology and lighting technologies for suppression of powdery mildew and strawberry, which is at uh, Rensselaer. Is that a French word? 
Anyways, Polytechnic Institute and Solutions for Managing Allium Leaf Miner. Okay, in um, Penn State University. Yeah, so not surprisingly, the Allium Leaf Miner is on Allium, right? Uh, however, um, yeah, th these are all very uh, interesting projects. I'm particularly taken with the... Um, the diamondback moth, because I have a lot of personal experience with that moth. It's a very difficult organism to deal with in crops, um, especially if you're not growing your crops in a, a very controlled space. Even a greenhouse can be uh, quite infested by these moths, so that can be difficult. Have you followed John Kemp's work out of Middlefield, uh, Middlefield, Ohio with AEA. I have some of it. I don't necessarily agree with a lot of it, to be honest. So, um, but I have kept up on some of it. The general sentiment is understandable and appreciable, but um, not everything that John Kemp says is something that I necessarily tout. Um, and there are a few things that are a little woo for me, to be honest. And that's what I have to say about that. But um, regarding this... Um, the use of different sorts of, of light and like particularly UVB light has been pretty effective at dealing with powdery mildew and botrytis. And those are really, really, you know, I keep saying this, but they're very difficult and expansive families or well, the powdery mildew family is difficult to deal with. And botrytis has a ton of different host plants and we're finding out more and more every, um, every couple of years. So honestly, if we can find a really good non-chemical control for the majority of erysipheles, powdery mildews, and botrytis, that could really usher in a, a, a much better um, agricultural sort of circumstance for cultivators. Because I think we, we probably, I don't know, probably more money than is being funneled into these various projects is lost every year on powdery mildew alone, plus botrytis, I'm sure, in crops. Um, I'm getting some comments, so let me, uh, let me res respond to them. Danky808 says, wasp or praying mantis could either be used to combat the diamondback moth. Not, maybe a parasitic wasp. There are some, I think, but, um, praying mantids aren't really great biocontrol agents in general, to be honest. Um, the big reason for that is because a lot of the really bad pests are not attractive to the praying mantis, particularly because they're so small. So a lot of the small pests go unnoticed, obviously, because it's such a large biocontrol organism in general. Um, the other problem with praying mantises is that a lot of them are, um, well, a lot of the Chinese mantises are obviously exotic. So you have that ecological environmentalism um, issue that if you care more about that, then you don't want to really support it. If you don't care about it as much, you're going to buy them. But honestly, praying mantises are only great against like maybe, I don't know, moths in my opinion, in the adult form, or maybe some caterpillars or something like that. Some big organisms. I'm not saying that they can't be helpful in, a, in, in some cases, it's just that in general, I don't find them very attractive as biocontrol agents for those reasons. Um, they just don't tend to control what is most commonly a big issue. Um, IACO Ryan, or IACO Ryan, you'll have to correct me on that, um, asks about plant secondary metabolites, and just kind of says that. That's pest management, I see. Which are, sap, which are saprophytic fungi that enter weak or incomplete cells. Is it possible to build healthier plants that are resistant? Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot to unpack in those four or five uh, statements here. Um, I think that secondary metabolites can be used effectively in IPM. And in fact, um, though none of these particular projects talk about it, I do know there are companies that are looking to use terpenes, for example, and other plant secondary metabolites. In fact, there are some products that are already out there that sort of, um, they'll operate on the immune system of the plant and that's great but if you're already dealing with a pathogen that's able to overmatch or defeat those defenses making them stronger might not be helpful because if the pathogen can simply upregulate a few genes and nullify that or totally circumvent it then you're really not putting a lot of energy in, and the immune system is very energy intensive for plants 
I mean, there's different aspects, but like the um, induced immune responses in plants are, uh, is very energy intensive. So it's not always the smartest move to do that. And you might be sacrificing uh, yield and productivity and growth in a way that you don't have to unnecessarily by using those, um, those controls in the wrong way. But you could totally use them for pests that maybe can't sequester certain compounds or use different compounds that they're not used to. That would be helpful and effective uh, use of plant secondary metabolites after absolutely. Um, your comment about uh, saprophytic fungi entering weaker incomplete cells, I'm not sure I get what you mean, but there are endophytes um, that can possibly be used to affect, I mean, already have been used in other cases to affect um, uh, pests like entomopathogenic fungi, like Bouveria bassiana, which I always talk about. Um, those are, uh, well, that species is faculatively endophytic. So sometimes it's endophytic, sometimes it's not. And there's different reasons for that. We don't know all the reasons for it. Um, but I think that there is something to be said of the for the use of microbials, um, specifically endophytes in that manner. <clears throat> very interesting, very cool concepts uh, that don't really that aren't really traditional, or rather that we don't have a lot of um, history utilizing effectively. But now with with greater understanding and comprehension of the very minute details of ecology, we can do that sort of a thing. Dinky08 says. I've been seeing people use the UV lights nowadays, but nobody could say how long the plants or infected areas need to be exposed to the light for it to actually work. Well, I do. I have um, at least posted, perhaps even made, I'm not even remembering if I made a video on the subject, but it, I should, even if I have already. Um, I definitely posted about UVB light in particular being used against um, spider mites, powdery mildew, and botrytis. And the amount of contact exposure time, depending on the intensity of the of the ultraviolet light, is very low. It's very low. It's like, in some cases, it's like less than a minute, I feel like, or maybe only a few minutes, if I remember the research right. And we're talking for like a an 80 or like a 90% um, rate of uh, of kill, like a mortality rate. It's it's pretty va it's pretty good. If you dial in the specifics, um, they're finding in research reports at least that that under those conditions, those specific conditions, they can be very effective. But they aren't using like UV wands or anything like that typically in these experiments that I've seen, that I've re that I've looked at. Uh, there might be new information which is always coming across, and I don't always have you know I don't always have that information in front of me, and um, I do rely on my network to sort of keep me appraised of what what is out there. Um, but UV light uh, is something that I'm very excited for if used properly and not used as a gimmick. Like biocontrols were often considered for a very long time. I don't want that to happen. I really hope that marketing people who are unscrupulous and utilize UV light and other other sorts of bleeding edge technologies in an ineffective way will make people not want to use them at all. That would be unfortunate. Um, oh, okay. So the point about saprophytic fungi. Yeah. So, um, I mean, powdery mildew is an obligate, uh, biotroph and botrytis is a necrotroph. So that's true. Um, you ask if it's ATP intensive, and um, I mean, yeah, it's energy. In it's energy intensive. It requires a lot of um, uh, of the production of, en I guess, the production of energy, right? ATP. I guess you could say that. I don't know if like metabolism necessarily increases in all cases. It's kind of a complex like process, and it's a little different for different plants, of course. When I say immune response is energy intensive, do I mean ATP or phospholipid? No, I mean generally speaking, it's it's a process that requires a lot of a lot of built up energy. And if a plant, in for example, if a plant is um, 
is one that has a lot of storage of energy or stores a lot of energy in like a tuber or a crom or something like that, or a corm, I should say, not a crom, a corm or something like that. What I'm really getting at, and I'm not speaking specifically about ATP or phospholipid uh, processes, I'm just talking about in general, the immune response of a plant is energy intensive, just like the immune response for people is very energy intensive. And, um, uh, so like, for example, systemic acquired resistance, uh, is an, it's a, it's a laborious process to, to turn on the channels and to, um, to utilize all of those secondary metabolites that are, for example, are being mentioned or the production of them over a long span of time. I don't necessarily even mean that like in the, the small, um, turnaround time of like detects an effector and then has a physiological reaction because that's also, uh, intensive as well. But I mean, just like in general, even the like long-term things like the production of trichomes that are, um, anti-microarthropod, for example, or antifungal, you know, the production of terpenes or the production of these metabolites in general is energy intensive. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions from you. How do we build that up more effectively? Says Ryan. Um, I mean, like, I don't even like that could mean a ton of things, right? So there's a lot of things you can breed. You can try to breed the plants to be more effective in that way. You can, um, utilize compounds to sort of induce an immune response when you want to potentially, um, you can do a few other things too, I'm sure, that aren't just coming up to my head um, off the cuff like that. Um, yeah, well, I'm glad that you love this, Ryan. Uh, it's a really complex topic of conversation, and it's a very, um, I guess you could say it's a, it's a topic of conversation that over time we become we become aware of how much we don't know, right? Like, uh, it's hard to talk in generalities and make blanket statements, um, partly because, uh, different, different species of plants can be so different from each other, even ones in the same genus. And also, um, it kind of depends on the context that you're talking about too. So I appreciate the questions always. And I really do appreciate the enthusiasm that people have when they come onto these live feeds. And I'd love to talk more about it. If you had more specific questions reg regarding the immune system of plants, but it is hard to make sort of generaliz generalizations for that reason. And I, um, I am loath to say the wrong thing on the internet and have it posted and have millions of people be like, no, that's wrong, blah, blah, blah. It could even be a grammatical mistake on my part, or maybe not what I intended to say. Um, you know, cause I'm kind of talking off the cuff here and responding to questions. However, um, it is something that I wish a lot more people had respect for the idea that like, uh, for example, with the secondary metabolites, the idea that like terpenes and, um, the, uh, plant immune system can be, uh, bolstered in some way is appealing. And, um, I think the innate immune response is, um, obviously crucial. And if we can find ways of, um, like buttressing that process, it would be great. But we also have to consider the fact that like certain pathogens can just totally circumvent it. Right. Or they have adaptations that allow them to neutralize certain aspects of the immune system proper. So in those cases, the use, just strengthening those routes are, is like a fundamentally incorrect way to go about it. Because all you're doing is making a sharper sword when the shield is literally impenetrable. Uh, you know, you have to make a new weapon in that case. Hopefully that metaphor makes sense. Yeah, I appreciate the support Dinky for sure. Um, Ryan says that he's up in Marquette, where uh, NMU is just starting their plant chemistry program, and they admit, we know nothing in the academic world. I don't know if they know nothing. Phytopathology has been around for a long time. Um, 
Oh, plant chemistry in regards to cannabis specifically, a four-year accredited program. Well, that's cool. That's a very, uh, that's a very nice, um, I guess that's an example of times changing, right? Um, but yeah, in general, phytopathology, it just gets more technical, really. Um, and certain things go from being very esoteric and then they come back around and they become uh, more fundamental and people understand them more fundamentally. And hopefully over time, maybe in the next few generations, uh, new agrarians and new agriculturalists will have um, a much more strengthened fundamental line of, of understanding, but there's always going to be new people, right. Who don't know any of those things. And there's always going to be older people who are maybe on the bleeding edge of new information. So we're always going to have that mixture of people, but it's my hope that in general, more people, people my age and people before me and people after me, honestly, more importantly, um, can, have access to a lot of content and not have it be like, you know, uh, protected by paywalls and require a whole lot of digging when the information can just be right there for you. Oh, and Ryan says he, uh, worked for the university of Florida doing organic strawberry research for Driscoll's and the doctoral students didn't know Jack when it came to this stuff to immune stuff. Well, I mean, doctoral programs are pretty specific. Um, I know somebody who recently told me that they, uh, and they work in agriculture and they work in like pathology or something. And they just learned that like thrips is plural and singular. And I'm like, how did you, how did you live? How did you live and breathe that work for like literally years and never find that out? So sometimes I'm always surprised that people don't know. I mean, even as insulated as I am and as much as I try to like remember that, I'm a bug nerd, I'm a plant physiology nerd, and um, things that are basic for me are not going to be basic for everyone, but still, that came across as, like, sort of deficient. But everyone has different experiences, too, and maybe they were just more specialized in different aspects of their program. It's hard to really make a judgment statement. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean... I'm glad, honestly, I'm glad that more people are going into it, or at least I, I hope that more people will be going into it. It's definitely a discipline that is not um, currently catered to very much. Um, Danky asks, but how many different ways or methods can we make that are staying the that are staying the somewhat natural organic path until they have to turn to chemicals made of made in a lab like they usually do? Seems like most pests nowadays that are in the spotlight for farmers or the home grower are all building a tolerance to what's currently available to use. Well, all right. Well, like the average gardener probably has very little um, understanding of like plant physiology <laughs> and, you know, subsequently probably even less about pest physiology, right? So like, and you know, the products that people buy for like the average gardener who doesn't really care about those sorts of things, um, they're not really, they're looking for simple. They want a simple solution that is cheap. That's like the goal, right? I don't think that's, I don't think that's a, a very controversial statement to make. So when it comes to marketing for that, or when it comes to producing a product that is that, it's usually a chemical solution for that reason. And no, you know, you maybe make it a little bit less uh, strong, or you sell a little bit less of it or something like that. Um, but ultimately, yeah, like, uh, there are other ways that people could defend their plants. There's other ways that people, I mean, if we wanted to be really, if we wanted to really get to, if we want to consider all of everything when it comes to plant cultivation for the average gardener, some people just shouldn't have gardens or at least certain kinds of plants in certain areas. You know, like if we wanted to be really, truly ecologically, whatever that means, you know, ecologically beneficial or have the least, you know, the smallest adverse footprint or whatever. In some cases, you know, it doesn't make sense to have a farm 
in certain places. But you can terraform the land, you can develop the land, but do you want to use your resources to do that? And how many resources, how much resources does that, is that? And not just the ones you have to pay for, but like environmentally, what are you doing in order to do that? And considering all those factors, gardeners aren't doing that. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, Ryan asks, uh, who are the researchers and teachers you look to for knowledge and inspiration? That's a good question. Um, some of them are retired or well, a lot of them are dead. <laughs> so nobody you could really interview always. Um, one mentor that I had was uh, a guy who is currently retired, just recently retired this year. His name is um, James Bethke. Uh, and Jim Bethke is a really cool guy. I really enjoyed uh, working with him in the UC Extension system. He was uh, incredibly gifted, was, still is, he's not dead or anything, incredibly gifted guy. Um, I uh, definitely enjoyed uh, his help when it came to learning about different biocontrol agents, particularly diglyphus was what I used a lot of. Um, and uh, at that time when I was, when I knew him most closely, and he did a lot of interesting work with them. He did a lot of interesting work with um, various organizations in California. He's written a bunch of papers. Oh, speaking of which, uh, Raymond A. Cloyd is also a person who is um, somebody I look up to and who I enjoy in the entomolo entomological world. Um, he worked a lot with parasitoids and still does, I do believe. And... Um, He's given some nice presentations, and he's wrote a lot of cool articles on the subject of different parasitic wasps and things like that. Um, a little hard to get a hold of, though, so that was sort of unfortunate. But but intelligent guy nonetheless, definitely somebody who knew what he was doing, right? Um, who are the... Okay, seems like... Wait, hold on. I'm up on the comments. Hold on. True. I'm just thinking that even the new home gardeners nowadays are already caught up in the organic way before they even get planted a seed. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's true. Um, but like, again, you know, for the organic gardener, there are a few other options out there, but usually you are, um, you're usually sacrificing the amount of time and effort you have to do, to set up a, um, a system that sort of continuously operates for the most part by itself. Uh, you take all of that work and effort and you sacrifice it for speed and efficiency, regardless of how it affects uh, the local area. And a lot of people honestly are going to choose that route. It's sort of the human thing to do. Um, unfortunately. Uh, but that, you know, it's like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Right? Like, you're going to tell people, you're going to tell an entire industry of people that like what they're doing is wrong or bad or, or whatever. It might, it might make some people, you know, you might be able to convince some people, but I, I do feel like there is a certain level of hopelessness when it comes to convincing people out of the things that they like and the amount of effort and time people want to take to educate and re-educate folks. Um, it's not everyone's cup of tea. It's mine, though, because that's why I make the content that I do. But, yeah, like, the vast majority of people, even if they do care, they don't really know what they're doing correctly. And if they really do care and they really know quite a bit, then they're not going to be going to a gardening store anyways. So you do run into that complication as well, unfortunately. Yeah, so you're very welcome for the uh, answers, and I really appreciate the questions, for sure. Um, it has... It has some tangential relationship to what I was talking about, too, so it all works out. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, if the USDA and in general, if the government spent a lot more time or a little bit more uh, money, I would say, um, investing in agriculture, investing in the new generation of people, I mean, and they do. I don't want anyone from the agricultural, uh, you know, any agricultural company or anyone coming in saying that they don't do that already because they do. They do. Um, obviously, this is a great example. $4.7 million, you know. 
two Tomahawk missiles. No, I'm just kidding. It's more than that. But, you know, where I'm getting with that is that, like, we could certainly up the ante quite a bit. And I and also I'm biased because I live in California. California is a pretty big agricultural sort of super center, um, which I didn't have an appreciation for when I was growing up. I thought, oh, the thing, and people have probably heard me say this story a bunch of times at this point, but growing up, being passionate about plants and insects and being kind of a naturalist, um, you know, I thought, oh man, nobody's going to care about that. So I'll just join the army, <laughs> which I didn't actually end up doing. However, um, it is like probably for the best, um, that I found out that California is in fact a huge, uh, agricultural sort of Mecca. And, um, uh, you know, my passions are quite valuable. So it kind of worked out that way. If I was like in the middle of nowhere and nobody grew anything, which is not typically the case, but you know, then maybe I'd have a different situation. But luckily everything kind of worked out. There was sort of some, I guess, birthplace determinism there. Um, perhaps I was influenced by all of the interesting and, and, and more like health conscious media and sort of culture surrounding California and Southern California in general. So gigantic organic, yo, yo to you too. <laughs> Does anyone else have any, like, questions regarding that sort of subject, since we're kind of on that topic, for example? I mean, um, the idea about, I mean, the concept of the plant immune system is very complex, and the interaction between pests and pathogens is necessarily complex as well, and I do think that with greater and greater um, technological aplomb, we will be able to, like do some really, really novel things. I mean, that's very, uh, that's not a very, like, articulate point to make, but it, but it's definitely true. As our technological and scientific understanding of the plant physiology increases, what we can and cannot do will also increase necessarily. And, and we might find that some things are not as great to do, or we might find that it would be a, a much better thing to do to move this route instead of that route, or it's less economical to do the one thing over the other. And, you know, that's, that sort of thing kind of coalesces as that information becomes more nascent. Yeah. So that's definitely true, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited. That was kind of the, the whole point of this video. I wanted to do a live feed video on, um, on kind of this article and subject in general. So, you know, Ace Ben Sex is here finally. Um, looking for I mean, you always have good questions and comments. So if you do have something, you're just tuning in. So um, we were talking about the um, this growing produce article by Christina Herrick um, regarding the investment of 4.7 million dollars to address critical plant pest problems. That's what the title says, and I was particularly taken for all the for all you who don't know, you know. You now know that this video is going on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, and um, if I, I don't think in this video I will be doing much editing with regards to some of the topics we were talking about, but I will mention the article and I will post it up there so you can see what I was talking about and investigate it yourself. But all these comments, all this interaction, this is going to go up on YouTube, so um, I'm warning you now. <laughs> But uh, people tend to really enjoy that, and they intend to have the like. They tend to appreciate the like, the like community interaction. So um, that's what I get a lot out of this as well. Yeah, no. So for you guys who are joining late, it's like I don't want to continue to say it over and over again. But um, you know, I do want to make sure that people are aware of it. Um, I do typically, you know, mention people's like screen names, and I do typically like um, respond to people in kind. So like, you know, just, just know that, you know, and know that you have a face to protect perhaps, and maybe don't be rude. I haven't had a problem with really rude people at all. So, um, but I know it happens eventually. <laughs> so I'm just getting used to it now. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoy the, um, the level of enthusiasm, um, 
I did recently pass 5,000 followers on Instagram, so that'll probably be my high water mark. <laughs> Maybe not. Hopefully not, right? I'm just being facetious. I do think that the level of enthusiasm is just increasing and increasing every year, and more and more people that I interact with that are interested in this sort of a thing ask me some really great, really cool questions, and I definitely appreciate the amount of positive feedback I've gotten from people. I was not expecting the kind of feedback that I get. All of these people just making memes, making funny little images, um, you know, and making, getting like hundreds of thousands of, of, of followers and people just posting random stuff that might not even be truth. I mean, epistemologically truthful. Um, you know, and it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a shame I feel like, but you know, I definitely appreciate dank memes and, and funny jokes and things like that. So, I mean, I'm not saying that those things shouldn't exist. I'm just saying that I hope that the sort of educational information that I work on and that other people that I know work on um, extensively get that sort of recognition too. I, I hope so, perhaps, in the future. That might happen more. <laughs> I don't know. Actually, going back to the question that was asked before about people that I appreciate in books, websites... Um, that sort of a thing. I mentioned, uh, you know, a former mentor of mine, Jim Bethke. I really liked him. Um, I like uh, Raymond Cloyd, I mentioned as well. Good academic um, examples. Uh, people who worked in extension and other sorts of things and have, have contributed to the academic literature on pests and pathogens. Um yeah, people who learn will hopefully do better. And I hope that, like, fundamentally, like, what is considered acceptable and normal, like, in 2018 might be here, and maybe in 2032 might be up here or up here, you know? And then, so basically, people will generally come in and have a lot more information, a lot more succinct information, because it's always, it can always get technical, but if you can simplify it basically down, and we have like a more uh, unified understanding of like plant physiology or or pest pathogens or whatever we can do that but i think i'm going to go here so um appreciate all of it and i will talk to you all later this will be on youtube so look out for it on xenthanol